The Government Accountability Office just wrapped up its 100th year in existence. The federal government watchdog continues to transform management efforts, analyze federal spending, and support the country in times of crisis. Gene Dodaro is Com Comptroller General of the United States and leader of the GAO. Gene, welcome to the program. Uh, good morning, Mimi. I'm pleased to be here. And congratulations on 100 years. Uh, GAO just wrapped up uh, the year of the 100th in 2021. Give us a quick overview of GAO's role and why was it created? Uh, GAO was created in 1921 following World War I. Congress had been concerned about the growing debt that had occurred during the war. And at that time, the federal government didn't have a regularized uh, budget process. The 1921 Act created not only GAO, but it created the Bureau of the Budget, which is now the Office of Management Budget, the President. It created a regular budget process, and then it created uh, GAO in the legislative branch in order to provide a check and balance on federal spending. And so our job at that time was to review uh, federal expenditures to make sure they were appropriate, consistent with congressional direction. Since then, we've changed uh, dramatically and have modernized over the years into a multi-dimensional, multidisciplinary agency that reviews all federal programs and activities for economy and efficiency and effectiveness. And our scope is the entire scope of the federal government's operations. Uh, and uh, we provide hundreds of reports each year about how to improve government performance and accountability. So the GAO's authorities come from Congress, but how do you ensure that federal agencies cooperate with your investigations to the fullest degree possible? Well, there are a couple ways here, Mimi. One is to make sure that the laws give us clear access and authority. And so we've worked with the Congress over the years to make sure the laws, for example, during the Great Recession and the um, global financial crisis, we didn't have enough authority at the Federal Reserve to do auditing there that we needed to do to fulfill our requirements under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. So Congress gave us additional authority there to review the Federal Reserve's emergency spending uh, programs. And so that's number one. But number two, is relationships. Uh, I meet with the heads or deputies of each department and agency as they're confirmed and come into government. Uh, if there's turnover, I meet with the new officials. We go over our relationships with GAO, the importance of cooperation, what we expect of them, what they can expect from us. And it's important to have good trusted relationships. Uh, but we monitor this from time to time uh, overall, we have very good cooperation, but from time to time, there can be problems in sensitive areas. Well, I wanted to ask you when those problems occur, what if, what, you know, what happens if federal agency leaders simply don't agree with your recommendations and just choose to ignore it? Well, if, if they choose to ignore our recommendations, well, first I would say maybe over 75% of our reg recommendations get regularly implemented by the federal departments and agencies and by the Congress, because we make recommendations directly to the Congress as well. So by and large, we have good implementation. It saves billions of dollars every year and improves government uh, programs and activities. But when there is difficulty, I will reach out to the head of the agency. Every year I send every department agency and the federal government agency head a list of open GAO recommendations that they haven't yet implemented. I prioritize which ones I think it's important for them to focus on, and then our teams follow up with their people. Ultimately, if they do not do this, then we work with the Congress, and Congress will insert language in appropriations or authorization bills. They'll hold hearings, they'll send letters, they'll communicate. So. Congress is our enforcement authority in this case, but the vast majority of our recommendations get implemented in a voluntary nature. GAO has a high risk list. Explain what that is. Well, in the late 1980s, there were a number of scandals that occurred in the government at HUD and the DOD and procurement areas. And Congress turned to us and said, you know, we'd like you to identify emerging risk and the highest risk across the government so we can focus on this. 
in our oversight agenda. So in 1990, we started to create the list. It initially maybe focused on fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement. We had programs like the Medicare program that were on the list at that time. So we started out with 14 areas. Over time, we've developed it to also include areas in need of broad-based transformation. There are 36 areas on the list now. We update it with every new Congress, so every two years, the beginning of the Congress, to help set the congressional oversight agenda and to also to help uh, in the administrations in the development of their management agendas. By law, OMB uh, has to review anything we put on the high risk list and a portfolio review. And right now I'm conducting meetings with OMB and the agencies on the high risk list to talk about what they need to do to get off the list. Nobody really likes to be on it. And, and uh, our goal is to get people off too while maintaining our independence. But there, the areas on the list range from Medicare, Medicaid, many areas in the Department of Defense, Weapon Systems Acquisition, DOD Financial Management, for example. Computer security is a high risk area that I added across government in 1997. We added critical infrastructure protection 2003. Unfortunately, it still remains on the list, as you know. Uh, and I still think federal government needs to pick up the pace commensurate with the evolving threat. Most recently, Mimi, we added uh, drug abuse and federal efforts to uh, prevent and respond to drug misuse. You mean drug this, misuse within agencies? No, this is drug misuse in the general public. I was concerned about the growing number of uh, deaths from overdoses. Uh, from fentanyl, opioids, and others. And you know, from 2002 to 2019, over 800,000 Americans died from a drug overdose. This past year, the most annual numbers uh, were close to 100,000 people. It was the highest number ever in uh, history since we've been recording these oversight deaths. And of course, the pandemic made the problem worse. Uh, but we think there needs to be greater federal leadership in this area more coordination, not only among federal agencies that are involved, but the federal, state, local level with healthcare providers, with law enforcement. And so we need some national leadership to deal with this issue. Let's talk about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. There were huge expenditures by federal agencies to address the crisis. And Congress asked GAO to oversee that pandemic spending. How has that been going? Uh, we've been uh, issuing regular reports. Mimi, what we were asked to do is to look at the impact of what's now you know, $4.8 trillion, what impact it was having on public health and the economy and giving aid to both uh, private sector organizations as well as many public sector organizations. And to track the funding, we were asked to give monthly briefings to the Congress beginning back after the March 2020 CARES Act was initially passed, which we've been doing. We were asked to issue bi-monthly reports, uh, which we did throughout 20 into 21. Uh, we're now issuing them on a quarterly basis. Uh, we've made over 200 recommendations to the agencies to make mid-course corrections in those areas. We've issued eight government-wide reports uh, talking about the status across the whole uh, federal government's uh, response efforts in this area. And Gene, uh, and what, what has been the most concerning though for you regarding what you found in your oversight of pandemic spending? Yeah, well, there's there's two things, Mimi. One on the, on the healthcare side, I thought we should have acted faster. And we made recommendations back in September, 2020 to develop a vaccine communication and distribution plan. We did a fabulous job in the government developing the vaccines through Operation Warp Speed and, and other efforts. And it was one of the highlights, I think, of the federal government's response. Uh, but we needed, based upon our early experience looking at H1N1 and other infectious disease efforts, we thought you need to get on top of this earlier. And so, unfortunately, we uh, did not. And uh, there have been some improvements in that area and we're still doing it, but we're still trying to communicate uh, to people the importance of vaccination efforts. Also, 
I thought we needed a, a stronger national testing strategy. In January 2021, we made a recommendation for that. We need better data, uh, but we need that. You, you can see some of the limitations we're having now in the testing area with the Omicron variant. So we're working with the administration. Now on the spending side, you know, in terms of the transparency and accountability, a lot of this effort, the Paycheck Protection Program, Economic uh, Injury Disaster Loan Program, the unemployment insurance area, the money was given out quick. So that, you know, was accomplishing the objective of speed, but there was trade-offs. There's much more fraud than anyone would have liked in those programs. You know, I wanted we, to ask you about that in particular, the unemployment insurance system, because you did look at that, the possibility of fraud. What was happening with that? Yes, well, the uh, states were overwhelmed. Their systems, a lot of their information technology systems were uh, antiquated. They hadn't been updated. This was the first time we had unemployment uh, areas hit all, almost all sectors of the economy at the same time. Uh, there were new federal programs that were implemented that they had to stand up in addition to their normal uh, unemployment insurance programs. Uh, we work with the Department of Labor Inspector General, and they focused a lot on the fraud areas. We also looked on, on the other side of it too, Mimi, about were people getting timely payments that were legitimate payments. And there were problems there too with backlogs and processing cases. So you had problems both with fraud, with people getting it that shouldn't have gotten it, as well as people who were due it that were delayed in getting their payments. So we're continuing to look at that program and we're, uh, and we'll have additional recommendations. I think we, we need to think about transforming our unemployment insurance program because of the changes we've had in the economy going forward. We need to modernize it. We're looking at that issue right now. And you had experience dealing with a crisis before with the global financial meltdown of 2008 and 9. Congress wanted uh, auditing of that financial rescue package. I wonder if that experience helped you respond better when the pandemic hit. Well, uh, very much so, maybe. I mean, we, we were primed to know how to do real-time reporting because in the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the $700 billion that was given to help unfreeze the credit markets and give capital infusions to financial institutions, we had to report every 60 days. We were required to be on site the day the legislation was passed. I remember talking to Secretary Paulson about, you know, making a little room for us over there at the Treasury Department. And then uh, under the Reco American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, we had to do bi-monthly reviews of the use of the money by state and local government. So we uh, have learned how to adapt and not only do traditional auditing, but do real-time auditing, which adds a huge dimension to GAO's capabilities and helps Congress in national emergencies. Gene, you have been at GAO for close to 50 years. I take it you like it there? Uh, I'm settling in, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate your work there and uh, good luck for the next hundred years. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Have a good day. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.